Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it. With the new Galaxy S24 Ultra and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. North Carolina has wrapped up the top seed in next week's tournament in Atlanta. However, Duke can still share the regular season title with a victory here today. Welcome to Episode 6 of Return to Glory, the story of the 2001 Duke Blue Devil National Champions. I'm your host, Jason Evans. Here we are six episodes into this oral history of that special season, and it's the first time we're talking very much about the rivalry with North Carolina. Though the 2001 season will be largely remembered for four historic battles with the Maryland Terrapins, as Duke entered the final game of the regular season, the Blue Devils found themselves looking up in the ACC standings at the Tar Heels. UNC was 13-2 in the conference and ranked number four in the land. Duke was 12-3 in the ACC and ranked number two in the country. But as you probably know, even without lofty rankings and ACC titles on the line, the Duke-Carolina game is always a big deal. Here's Duke's All-American, Shane Battier. Um, A lot of the guys in in my era, if they didn't go to Duke, they would have gone to Carolina. If they didn't go to Carolina, they would have gone to Duke. And So we we know these guys. We played pickup ball with them in in the summer. Uh, They obviously have an amazing tradition of winning. And and we we respect them. I mean, we didn't like those guys, um, but and they didn't like us. But I think there was a great deal of of mutual respect and 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 honoring the tradition, you know. And you know, Coach K was uh, my. I learned that by my freshman year, where there was a player who was kind of farting around before um, a Carolina game in practice, and he like kicked the kid out of practice. I'm not gonna say who he was. But he said, you don't mess with this game. You don't mess with this game. And so I'm like, okay, this, this is real. And then you go to, you know, you go to like Harris Teeter, you, you go to like the, the grocery store or the gas station, and you can just feel the rivalry. I mean, you know, it was Duke and Carolina. There, there, there was no, there was no fan to both. And you felt that everywhere you go, like, be Carolina. You know, I'd be at dinner somewhere, be Carolina, you know. And, uh, and so it, it's really unique for that area where, you know, it, the, the, you're choosing a side. You're choosing a side and the passion is real, you know, but I would say it's a, it's a collegial uh, rivalry and not as venomous as I think most people from the outside would, would, would think. Sophomore wing Mike Dunleavy echoed those comments he vividly recalled the team being locked in for this matchup with the Tar Heels. Uh, you know, there's a there's just a sense of urgency uh, that we had in that Carolina game, uh, going into it and and during the game. I just remember, you know, c- coach always demanded a certain level of attention to detail and focus. But that game, probably because we were concerned about getting our tails beat pretty bad if we didn't show up and play well. Uh, we were really dialed into that game. But the Blue Devils will be shorthanded. Carlos Boozer, their low post player. He is out with a broken bone in his right foot. As you just heard, Duke would be playing without their best big man, Carlos Boozer. But Coach K had a plan. The team would play fast, faster than they ever had to prevent Carolina's imposing front line from dominating the game. And that meant getting everyone in the best shape of their lives. Here's All-American point guard, Jay Williams. And I'll never forget that game, because I remember we, we started practicing so hard. Like we already were in good condition, but our conditioning went up another notch after that because 
Coach K knew that in order for us to play at the speed to tire teams out, like we had to be even better conditioned. And I'll never forget that time lead up to Carolina. Like I, I felt like I had lost weight. Uh, we were running a lot more. We were getting so many more shots up in, uh, in our off time. It just felt like things started, like we, we became very fine tuned at this Golden State Warrior style of basketball in 2001. Right. Yeah. And uh, that that running gun, shoot as many threes, let it fly, play loose, go after it. That was our game changer, because once we, like, we got hot at the right time, we started making shots. And I felt like there was no team in the country that could beat us with that style of play. But we never find that unless Boozer gets hurt. And unless we have that moment where Coach K walks in the room and says, if you guys believe in me, we're going to win a championship and this is how we're going to do it. The Duke team was eager to see how their new strategy would work. Shane Battier recalls the feeling of anticipation as they readied to unveil it. We go to North Carolina, last game of the year, and you know, I think they were like eight-point favorites or ten, whatever. They were, they were big-time favorites over us. And we all got off the bus with a look that said, we know something you don't know. And I'll never forget that. We know something you don't know. You don't know it's coming. Part of what Carolina did not see coming was how Duke would deploy Boozer's replacement, Casey Sanders. The way Shane Battier tells the story, Casey had one job on offense. Get Shane open. We started uh, Casey Sanders that game, and he was my personal screener. And Coach K said, Casey, I don't care where Shane is on the court, you go screen for him. Which is like crazy, right? I, was like, I never had a personal screener before. So Casey's job, his only job was to get me open. And so wherever I was on the court, he would come screaming, man, I'd come off, I'd make a play or pass to Jay Will or, or Don Levy. And, and the other rule he gave me is, Shane, just go run around and make plays. You know, he said, like, you're, you're like Ronnie Lott out there. You're free safety. And if you want to go trap a guy, go trap a guy. And if you want to go just leave your man and, and double team somebody, go double team him. If you want to pick up full court, pick up. And, and it was an amazing amount of trust, obviously, that I thought I earned with Coach K after all, you know, four years, but just to run around and, and, and make things happen and be disruptive and be instinctual. And that's what, he, that's what he taught us all is be instinctual. Now, um, that was a pretty, so when people ask me about that, that game, um, I said, literally, my instructions were run around and make make something happen. <laughs> Which I don't, I don't know if it was sustainable. I don't know if it was repeatable. Uh, but for that single game, um, it was pretty disruptive. Okay, trust me. We're going to get to Shane running around and making plays in a little bit. But first, I just had to ask Casey if the conversation with Coach K had really been the way Shane described it. Was Casey's main job just to be Shane's personal screener? So I was like, yeah, I can play D. And then he's like, set screens for Shane. I was like, perfect. You mean to tell me I don't have to worry about anything except for when he shoots it to go run it down and try to get it back to him or put it back there or try to dunk on somebody? I was like, this is great. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of like... <laughs> It was kind of like what I used to fantasize back in high school when I'd be like, man, I wish I had just awesome players around me and I could just do all the fun stuff, like try to dunk on people or <laughs> set screens and roll off and, you know, call for the alley-oop and, you know, stuff like that. Just be the type of player that I really wanted to be, which was that flashy, athletic player. One of the things um, uh, at Duke that you learn, you know, on the court and off the court is how to use your resources. Like coach is big into that. Like don't, you know, do poorly in a class because you were too afraid to use your resources or ask for help. Like that's a ridiculous thing. And to this day, I still, to this day have that feeling. So I knew how to use Shane. I knew screening for him, getting him open. Shane's going to get buckets. I knew Jay will get out of his way. When he goes to the cup, go get the rebound. Anytime he's going to the bucket, don't look for him to pass because he's a finisher, that's what he does. Casey Sanders wasn't the only player excited about his new role. His roommate, sophomore Nick Horvath, was positively giddy. Like Casey, Nick was a backup big man for Duke, but he'd been injured earlier in the season and was taking a red shirt. 
Horvath, though, was thrilled to see the way the team designed a strategy that would play into Casey's strengths. Casey was in the same boat as me, but then suddenly he had to be relied on. He had to start. He was the guy, and he so they so they simplified like the game was simplified, and he just had to go out and do what he did, and he played great. It was so fun to watch. You know, he was suddenly that guy in the middle of these good teams. We were playing fast. Casey was running up and down the court, catching alley oops. You know, it was awesome. There's rules like, you know, because Casey could catch anything above the above his shoulders. He could throw it anything up there and he could catch it. Anything below his shoulders was dicey. So it just became a thing like just set screen, rebound, and then if you have to throw it to Casey, throw it up. And it worked, you know, like he – Duke is such a machine, you know, and there's always, you know, 10 guys that are so good. You know, Casey would have never had that chance unless Carlos got hurt. That was the cool thing for me about that year is him getting that chance because it made the team better. Because then when Carlos came back, Casey was, was there, which was awesome. But it wasn't just Casey Sanders who would be tasked with filling in for the injured Carlos Boozer. It was also freshman Reggie Love. Love was a football player, a tight end, who would join the team in December when the football season was over. He'd barely played any college basketball at all prior to being deployed against North Carolina's towering front line. I asked Reggie if he was nervous, and his answer may surprise you. It's weird though, right? I was so young and stupid, right? Like, I don't, I, I'd always played, right? I had not, not really gotten playing time. You know, at the beginning of my football season, I didn't, I didn't play. Uh, I played behind a couple other guys, and then like, you know, someone like forgot their mouthpiece. I started against Georgia Tech, and like I think I scored like, you know, I scored a touchdown like in my first like ten starting snaps, right? And so I just kind of always thought that like, you know, wherever I go, whatever I do, I'm going to compete. So I wasn't really like nervous. I was like, oh yeah, this is great. It's time for me to like go compete, and like we'll see what happens. And you know, I, you know, worst thing that happens is you lose, right? So. Uh, I, I don't think I was in any weird mind space just because, you know, I think that's what all of it's about, right? Like you do all the practicing and all the preparation, you know, for those opportunities. So I was like excited about it and, and probably like a little too young and too stupid to be nervous. He may have been young and stupid, but Reggie Love did know to listen to what Coach K wanted. I asked if he also was told that his job was to set screens for Shane Battier. You know, when Coach K said, well, look, we're not, you know, we're no longer the biggest. So now we're going to be the fastest and we're going to be the fastest and the best conditioned. And so we would, you know, we would train and practice this idea that we were going to play, you know, these five minute bursts where for five minutes we were going to sprint. And then we'd sprint for five minutes uh, and then you get to the TV timeout and then you'd get a break. And if you couldn't sprint, you'd come out. Uh, talk to me about what your role was in that sort of newly designed team structure. Um, defend the big. Uh, make sure that you make the big sprint every time down because they were to make sure that they were exhausted so that the, that so that when they got to the offensive end they'd be too tired to to actually want to play offense. Uh, and to uh, and to keep them out, of, to keep them from the basket. You know, a lot of high ball screens, um, and making other bigs have to defend uh, Jason or Mike or Chris or whomever off the dribble. Uh, and now, a lot of screens for Shane. A lot of screens for Shane. Yeah, uh, uh, Shane. Shane said that coach told Casey Sanders that Casey's only job on offense was to screen for Shane. Did, did you get similar instructions? Same, similar instructions. <laughs> I mean, come on, take me through that conversation. Well, I never really, I mean, sometimes Casey would get confused on like how to like space the court. And so he would sort of, you know, and so then it, and I think it was like more of a mnemonic sort of device to like, to keep him like in the right frame of mind. Uh, Coach K, I don't think actually ever said that to me, but 
I'm a student of the game, and so like I can like pick up on cues. So you could tell he didn't have to say it. You understood your job yeah. was to scream for Shane and the other shooters. Yeah, yeah. I, I was never like, oh, do you want me to pick and pop? <laughs> <laughs>All right, enough of the preamble. Let's get to the game itself. Minus Carlos Boozer, the conventional wisdom was that Carolina's front line of Brendan Haywood and Chris Lang would have their way with the smaller and less experienced Duke big men. But Casey Sanders was ready to surprise them. During that game, I remember coming out and just the feel of it in there. They were ready for the chicken dinner. And my God, they had already cooked it. It had been cleaned, prepped, buttered, all the sides are out. <laughs> and the only thing they got left to do is pull out that knife and fork and pop it into that chicken and bite a good chunk out of that Duke bird. And the whole time that Duke bird's going, nah, not today. Because we knew what we were bringing to the table. And like I said, I was an arrogant, uh, you know, you have to have certain type of arrogance to be in that environment. And I was as such like, yeah, those other guys are good, but guess what? I'm good too. And if you guys say we're done and we're just replacing one All-American for another, and yeah, you guys don't know about me, but hell, I came in with a pretty good reputation. And I just remember during the course of that game, feeling like we we can do this. And my God, the, when we locked into him was at this moment, when we were moving up and down the court so fast, those wind sprints, that preparation, that belief in one another, I was tired. And my God, to get me tired at 19 years of age, come on, dude, that's... <laughs> I think about that now at 41 and at 19, like, dude, I could run forever. It would take immense stuff to get you tired. But again, that immense belief, that whole attitude in that building. And again, once we saw those guys sucking eggs, because Lang got tired, Haywood got tired, then guess what? Your muscles don't mean much. All that pushing and fighting you, you know, you want to make a coward out of any man, you get him tired. They get it into Lang on the jump hook. He's thrown up over everything. Duke is playing small right now and looking good. Small and quick. And they all can handle and they all can shoot. This is a Duke team named Desire. Kick corner, Duhon. Three ball, yes. Here comes Jason Williams now, speaking of great point guards. Three is on the money. Duke was racing around and raining three-point shots all over the Tar Heels. Jay Williams would eventually hit seven threes all by himself on his way to scoring 33 points in the game. He recalls the pace just destroying the bigger Tar Heels. I remember second half, four or five minutes into the second half, looking at Brendan Haywood and Chris Lang bent over with their hands on their knees and I remember Chris Lang just had this, <gasps> and I'm like, <laughs> and I remember me looking at my teammates and like dudes up straight, like walking around, like being bouncy, like Chris Duham bouncy, right? Um, Del Levy's going, Shane is talking about what we're going to do. And I'm like, damn, I feel good right now. Oh, yeah, we're going to kick their ass. Yes, this is about <laughs> to happen. This is about to happen. Um and that was kind of like one of those moments where we just, we kept letting it fly. And they just, they had to play small. They couldn't play big. And then they were trying to match us on our speed and the way we played. And that wasn't the way they played the whole year. Uh, so once you feel like you have a team trying to play to the speed that you're dictating, you feel like you're going to win that game. You know you're going to win that game. Okay, sure. The speed and the threes were making it difficult for North Carolina. But there was one more aspect to this game. Heart. Remember we talked about Reggie Love being a part of Coach K's plan for battling the Carolina big men? Well, Reggie was only six foot five, more than half a foot shorter than Carolina's Brendan Haywood. But Reggie never backed down. 
and it inspired his teammates. Here's Duke's Andy Borman. I just remember vividly, like Reggie, front team, Brendan Hayward in the post, and, and you know, Reggie's 6'5", and this guy's 6'11", and, and Brendan Hayward just couldn't get post position, and Reggie was just fighting him tooth and nail and rebounding everything, you know, and, and Casey blocking shots and catching alley-oops, and Casey has such a... a generous, you know, generous personality. They, they, they were so easy to cheer for. You know, they they were so easy, you know, to not not just because we wanted to win, but because of who each of those guys are as people. They weren't ever in it alone. So heart and desire were a big part of it. But Reggie Love also told me that Coach K had a strategy for making the Carolina big men uncomfortable. Coach K just was able to identify, you know, how to best use the talent at the time uh, to create to create an advantage. And then, like when the, when their bigs got the ball in the post, we just doubled the shit out of them. We we're like, all right, we're gonna double you, and like we're gonna rotate, and we're gonna be fast enough to make two or three rotations, and you know, and like, and it wasn't gonna be a late double, right? The double was gonna come like when the ball's in the air the double team was going to meet you at the same time the ball got there. So you were never going to, you were always going to be uncomfortable in the post. And that was the other thing is that a lot of bigs weren't like great passers, right? So like Brennan Haywood, Chris Lang, great basketball players, not great passers. And as I promised, there is one more thing we have to talk about from this game. Remember Shane Battier told us that Coach K instructed him to run around and make plays? Shane was one of the best help defenders in college basketball history. And one of those plays signified the way Shane was always there when his teammates needed him on defense. Here is Brent Musburger's call of what may be Shane Battier's most famous blocked shot. Outside, Dunleavy. Williams fake, kick it back now, Dunleavy, and great steal by Forte. He'll go for two. No! Oh, yeah. what, a play. what a play! That's one of the great defensive plays you'll ever see right there, baby. That was unbelievable. And Williams for the three. It's a five-point turnaround on Mr. Battier's defensive play. Oh, my! Joe Forte was Carolina's best guard, and he was running unopposed to the basket for a dunk. But Battier swooped in like a leopard, pouncing on his prey to block the shot. As you heard, it was Duke's Mike Dunleavy who lost the ball on that play. He had a unique perspective on Shane's blocked shot. The only play I remember from that game was, um, and it was kind of a classic, just have your back play. I had the ball, went on offense, went to drive, got it stolen. And uh, they were going. Joe Forte was going down the other way for for what looked like a wide open dunk. And Shane chased him down and got a, just a fingertip or a fingernail on the ball and knocked it out of his hand and hit the rim. And we recovered it. And it was one of those key signature plays in Shane's career. But it was sort of embodied, you know, him and the team and everything at the moment of just, you know, kind of everybody's got each other's back. I made a mistake. He covered up for me. And that. That was, that was sort of our way. You know, it's interesting. Shane Battier didn't really want to talk about that block shot. It was just one play in what would be a 14-point Duke victory. He wanted to talk about how it felt to win the game, where no one gave them a chance. A game where they showed the heart and tenacity of a champion. You know, I loved beating Carolina. It was great. They, I mean, like, they, they were especially a little chuffed with themselves. Like, oh, we got this. No boozer. They got no chance. And I'll never forget, just we hit them right in the mouth with all of our aggressiveness, our three-point shooting. I'm running around making plays. Casey Sanders is, is, uh, is screening for me. We put Reggie Love in, who's guarding Brendan Haywood, who's given up like 80 pounds and like five inches. And Brendan Haywood can't do anything against Reggie Love. I think Brendan Haywood has like four points and three rebounds and a block against Reggie Love. And we walk out of that game after blowing them out in Carolina win the ACC championship in the regular season and 
as I got in the bus, I said, we're winning this thing. <laughs> we are winning this thing. <laughs> so with their confidence soaring, the Blue Devils were ready to embark on the postseason, the ACC tournament, and the NCAAs. More on that when returned. Welcome back to Return to Glory, the story of the 2001 Duke Men's Basketball National Champions. Next week, we're going to take a little break from the games to give you some insight into Coach K from the men who played for him. It's me about Coach. Like, um... You know, his humor, man, he, he's so funny. He's such a funny guy. And from that moment forward, he's Coach K. He's not, he's not Uncle Mike any longer. And then Coach K does a somersault and rolls in, like a rolls in with an with a Army fatigue helmet on and says, let's fucking attack! And we just jump up like some warriors, bro. And we go out there and we, we just destroy the team, whoever we played against, by like 40. The best Coach K stories as told by the 2001 team on the next Return to Glory. Return to Glory is written, hosted, and edited by me, Jason Evans. It is a production of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the DBR podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And if you want to email us, just send it to dbrpodcast.com at gmail.com. Once again, my thanks to every member of the 2001 team for chatting with me about their championship season. I'll see you next week on Return to Glory.